uh, Reserve Studies and Building Maintenance, uh, hosted by the Downtown Sarasota Condo Association. My name is Alex Turner, and I am a Business Development Manager with Associate Gulf Coast Management. And thank you to the DSCA for the opportunity to moderate today's program. And thank you to everybody for attending, especially in the middle of a hurricane, your, um, your dedication to your association is to be commended for sure. And uh, lastly, before we start our introductions with our panel, I'd like to recognize and honor our veterans today. The sacrifice our veterans and their families have made for us seems even more important in today's climate. So thank you to any veterans who are on our call today your families, and all past and present service men and women. And now I'd like to introduce our current and undisputed DSCA president, Eileen Normiel. Hopefully undisputed. Thank you, Alex, for recognizing the veterans on this Absolutely. day. That, that was very fitting. Good evening. I'm Eileen Normile, president of the Downtown Sarasota Condominium Association. And I'd like to welcome you to our Reserve Studies and Building Maintenance webinar. We thought we'd arrange a little hurricane. And uh, to take your mind off the weather, you might just need a little building maintenance after this is over. <laughs> so you might want to pay really close attention. I know we have excellent speakers tonight. And as always, the Downtown Sarasota Condo Association seeks to bring you interesting and useful information by experts in their fields. If you'd like to receive notices of future events and receive information-packed newsletters from DSCA, please contact us through our website at www.downtownsarasotacondoassoc, short for association.com. I'd like to thank Kristen Forey, Jamie Still, and Patrick Gannon for all the work they put in here. Their tireless efforts are bringing this to you on what is a very, very stormy night. Thank you for joining us. Please enjoy the DSCA Reserve Studies and Building Maintenance webinar and Alex, take it away. All right, thank you, Madam President. And uh, now on to our esteemed panelists who we are so grateful for their time and expertise. Please welcome Patricia Stabler with Stabler Engineering. Patricia? Hello. Good evening, everyone. And it's not Stabler Engineering, it's Stabler Appraisal and Consulting. But I thank you for the word engineering because <laughs> we added engineering, actually. But it will not be reflected in our name. Um, I am coming from commercial cost estimating uh, in civil engineering and became an appraiser with specialization on reserve studies, insurance appraisals, and FEMA appraisals. And um, we just announced this month. Uh, that civil X engineering and stable appraisal and consulting will um, cooperate for turnover studies, site development, swift mud compliance, and stormwater management. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Uh, now on to Jimmy Bonner with Sherwin Williams. Hello, Alex. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I have been in the paint industry for 22 years, 17 of those years with the Sherwin Williams Company. Um, I've only been in Florida for six years. Uh, the rest of my career was in Tennessee, um, but I have dealt with the property maintenance world uh, with uh, large projects and things like that for about 10 years with Sherwin Williams. So once again, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And now on to George Root, who is our legal eagle today. Good evening, Jimmy. I'm also from Tennessee originally, but uh, I've been down here for about 17 years. Uh, my name is George Root. work at uh, Frisch & Ross. We're a general counsel firm. We represent uh, four or 500 condos and HOAs in the area's general counsel. And uh, glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks, George. And finally, our Community Association Manager Expert from Gulfstream Towers, Natalie Muno. Hello, everyone. My name is Natalie Muno. I thank you for having me. I am a Community Association Manager at Gulfstream Towers, downtown Sarasota. I've been in the property management business for about nine years and with Gulfstream for about a year now. Gulfstream Towers is actually one of the first built condos on the Gulf in downtown Sarasota. They were built in 1958. 
And in order to maintain our old building, uh, we do have a fully funded reserve budget and per our reserve study. So this kind of ties with the topic and thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Natalie. And I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to our Platinum Associate, Associate members. For Thank you so much for supporting the event this evening. And please stay tuned to the end of our program because our sponsors are going to be raffling off some prizes this evening. And I'd just like to ask Patrick, um, I'm not able to currently share my screen. It's saying that it's been disabled, so I can't get the program up if you wouldn't mind giving me permission for that. And then I'm just gonna go over a few housekeeping items while we're working on that. Um, I think everybody's got their self on mute, so thank you very much. And if you'll keep that going through the end of the meeting um, and we will start taking questions at the end and you're welcome to unmute yourself at that time. Additionally, throughout the webinar, you're welcome to use your chat function and put any kind of questions in the chat. And Chris and I both will be keeping an eye on that and we'll be glad to ask our panelists throughout the meeting your questions. Um, and then let's see here, uh, your videos are all off, so you did great on that. And then um, if anybody didn't already currently indicate during their registration that they wanted to be put in on the, um, the raffling of the prizes, feel free to put your name in the chat and we can add you to the list for that as well. All right, I'm gonna see if I now have sharing. I do, thank you, Patrick. Okay. All right, we're through a little of these already. So great, these are the webinar protocols. I think we got through all of those. Thank you very much. So we're gonna get this going um, right now. And um, so, well, with all aging buildings in Florida, maintenance is a must. And uh, the need for major renovations, excuse me, renovation sometimes comes sooner rather than later. Um, and when a condominium board meets to discuss a capital uh, renovation project, the typical process starts by determining where do you begin? What are the specs? What is the best method to be used? Should you restore the original design, upgrade to newer materials, the newer codes? Um, and if it's been a few years since you've had your last reserve study, you may want to start by obtaining a current reserve study. And Patricia, what is a reserve? Can you tell everybody what a reserve study is and how a condominium association can plan uh, to fund for reserves? A reserve study is an outlook into the future for 30 years. The association has to calculate what it will cost to replace major items. And uh, usually we look at a 30 year outlook into the future. And uh, in the reserve study, we include all major uh, replacements. So everything what is um, happening on an annual or monthly basis would be covered under operating. We are talking here about roof replacement, exterior paint waterproofing, um, railings, elevators, fire pumps, all items which are um, over $10,000. And for the condominium association under 718, that is a must, as you can see on the slides. However, in the past two or three years, more and more homeowners associations, which are regulated under 720, are also getting reserves and they update them on a regular basis. Thanks, Patricia. Um, George, what are the legal requirements for a condominium when, uh, in regards to reserves? You're on mute, George. Whatever you were saying was brilliant though, I know it. <laughs> it was much better than it will be now. So uh, uh, sorry you guys missed out on that. Um, uh, the condo <laughs> statute 718.112F, uh, paragraph two designates four categories, um, roof replacement, building painting, uh, concrete pavement resurfacing, and then any other category that is over 10K. Uh, in big condominiums, that's usually including HVAC, plumbing, pool equipment, wow. elevators, any major component that's 10K or above. I won't spend much time on HOA since I think primarily our audience is condominiums. Uh, HOA um, reserves are established by majority vote of the membership or developers. And then once those are 
uh, reserve, they have to be fully funded unless you have the membership vote. That, that's an over simplistic view of it, but uh, um, did that cover what you need, Alex? It did, it did. And what, if you'll follow up, do you, all associations in Florida have to have a reserve study? I don't think that 718, 719, or 720 require that, but I certainly wouldn't recommend that, that you go without one. Uh, I advise all my clients to get them. Um, if it's a situation where it's cost prohibitive, at least get estimates from different, um, different vendors to make sure you have an idea of what the replacement cost is. Because as Patricia was alluding to earlier, uh, how much you need to be reserving for on a monthly and yearly basis is a function of the useful life of the product and uh, the replacement costs. Thanks, George. Um, Natalie, as far as the manager is concerned, what role do you see yourself playing in um, creating a reserve study? So I think the first thing to do as a manager is definitely to assign a board member or a committee member or somebody who's involved in working on the budget um, to kind of work on the update of the reserve study and work with the engineer and be involved throughout the process to also have a set of eyes on it along with myself as the manager. Um, and then once the process starts, I think it's important to include, of course, any changes to the components. You want to make sure any work that's been done in the reserve components is included in that update. And then also, if you have any planned projects coming up, you want to make sure that you let the engineer know that those are going to be done next year or the following year. So that way, when they time everything in the reserve study, they can do it accordingly. Um, the other thing you want to do when you get your first draft is have your accountant review the beginning and the ending balances and the reserve line items. So you want to make sure that in your reserve study, the numbers match what your financial state that how much money you currently have in the reserves and what you're projected to have at the next year. Um, once you get the, the draft, you, of course, you want to review it. You want to have the board members review it. And then once you get that final product, when it comes time for budget season, make sure that you're also including those updates in the budget process as well. And then the last thing that's, of course, important to do is to notify your insurance agent mm -hmm. of the updates because you might have changes in policies, things that, you know, might get changed there as well that your insurance agent can take care of. And then when it comes time for your insurance appraisal, you let that engineer know as well that you've had the reserve study, send them the updated information so they can also make their changes accordingly. Excellent. Thanks, Natalie. Um, let's see here. Reserve studies. George, how, how often do you feel like a reserve study should be updated in the state of Florida with associations? Well, I don't think there's a statutory mandate in 718, 719, or 720 that requires certain frequency with which to do it. I mean, it, there's, it, there's no requirement to do it at all. However, uh, I think a good rule of thumb is every three to five years, um, you know, th there's a lot of things that could change your uh, analysis and your projection. Um, if you have a heavy storm season, or inflation, there's a number of things that would make you want to adjust, um, adjust your calculations. Thank you. Natalie, same question to you. Um, do you feel like most of the associations or the association you deal with updates the reserves every three years? Yeah, I think three, five is pushing it. Three years is, is great. Um, we, even though it's not a requirement, but by statute, it's absolutely important to have. And, and as George said, especially when you have projects going on and things are happening with the economy, you don't know how much things are going to cost. You want to make sure that you're getting that actual cost information and making updates to your budget accordingly. Definitely. And Patricia, as the person coming out and actually doing the reserve study, what's your thoughts on the three to five year time frame? Well, I have to disappoint you. I have to crush the dream of the three to five years completely. <laughs> okay. um, and and here's, here's the reason why. Uh, it heavily depends on um, the message you're holding funds as an association. When, it is, uh, when you hold funds in a component straight line uh, funding method, you can get away with every three years uh, because the component straight line method can be calculated in Excel if need be. But if an association is pooling their reserves and pooling is always a less conservative method, it is highly recommended to update the reserve study every year. 
Absolutely. from my portfolio in reserve studies. Meanwhile, a third of all my clients are coming back every year to update um, the reserve study. And it has also to do with the amount you're holding in your funds. When you are a small association with three to 400,000 balance in the bank, you also can get away with your three years. But if you are a high rise community and you're holding a million plus in your funds, uh, you need to update that study more than every three years. Thanks, Patricia. Natalie, did you have something to add to that? She's totally right. I wasn't thinking of pooled reserves every year. All right, very good. And Patricia, we're going to get into pricing a little bit later on, but do, in the packages that you offer, the pricing that you offer, do you do you have something where you come back every year to update that? Once we have an established reserve study, the updates are fairly easy to do. Okay. And because we never know how much cooperation we receive, receive from the management and from the finance committee or board, uh, we do it by on an hourly basis. Nice, thanks Patricia. Um, all right, so since it's not mandatory that association obtain a reserve study, from a, from a professional per se, like Patricia. Uh, board members may choose to set up their own reserve study and or perhaps call in various service providers to give estimates on replacement costs uh, in effort to save money. Um, Patricia, while I think we know, what's your, uh, can, the, can the board create their own reserve study and what's your opinion on that? Of course they can create their own reserve study. And my opinion on it, Bad idea, goes to liability, but I leave that to the attorney. Um, even if you have an engineer um, on, on the board, and let's say the in, this engineer understands component funding and even pooling funding. This engineer might be on the board for two or three years and then the board turns over and then boom, you don't have that person anymore on the board or the person is even moving away. So if you want to have consistency, you should always have uh, an unbiased, out of community professional. And I also try to adopt the, the, the motto of the police, don't police your own neighborhood. Um, it, it's simply not good to do it. And when there is a mistake, um, and we see that very often. I mean, I've taken over a couple of associations where we um, were provided with in-house uh, prepared budgets based on estimates and based on uh, bids by uh, third party providers like the roofer, the painter. And um, a lot of the items were simply overseen. For example, um, railings. Railings a big issue in high rises. People don't, just don't think about them. And suddenly they come up and add a huge amount to a uh, facelift or facade renovation. Thanks, Patricia. George, what, from a legal standpoint, what's your opinion on um, association board members who do their own uh, reserve analysis? Well, I, I tend to agree with Patricia. I try to give conservative advice. Um, there, the board basically has a fiduciary duty to the membership. And so you wanna make a good faith effort to support why you're reserving certain amounts and what the replacement cost is. And, you know, circumstances are different for every association. A thousand unit condo is gonna be different than a 10 unit um, condo and they have different considerations to consider. So I think you're gonna be held to a higher standard if you're, you know, managing a couple of million dollars versus a couple of thousand. Um, you want to try to use a professional reserve company to help you put together the reserve study every time. Uh, maybe if you're a smaller condo, you can get away with uh, piecemealing the reserve report, having several estimates on several components and help you put it together. But um, when you can, I'm always going to advise you to do a reserve study as often as possible by the most professional outfit available. Um, you obviously don't want Jim, the handyman, uh, opining about what it's going to take to replace the, the pavement and the cost thereof. So um, I, I like Patricia's advice in this area. Thanks, George. Um, Jimmy, what's your, I'm sure you get calls 
a lot from board members wanting to know what it's going to cost to paint and redo the building. What's your response to board members who believe they already know all the items that need to be in a reserve study? Well, without a doubt, uh, the most common mistake is the, the boards not putting everything in their reserve studies. Um, it, a good reserve study is going to turn up several things that the board didn't even think about. In, in painting projects specifically, and as P Patricia said, you know, maybe there's an engineer on the board. It seems like every board has had somebody who's owned a painting company or my father owned a painting company or my brother owns a painting company. And there's so many things that they don't think about that go in that, like the cost of maybe stucco repairs, the cost of sealants, the cost of uh, waterproofing that, you know, that, that goes above and beyond just a regular paint job. Um, I might be able to fill in those gaps, but I don't want to assume the liability on things like that. So uh, a good reserve study will, will really project the future costs of replacement. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, Natalie, have you had any experience where the board's asking you to go out and get um, estimates for reserve items or reserve studies? I caught you on mute. Sorry about that. That's okay. There are many creative board members who uh, come up with good reserve studies, but they're just not always going to include everything that needs to be included. Just like Jimmy was just saying, um, actually at Gulfstream, I'm happy to share an example. Um, in the past, when it came time to have our building painting done, uh, it turned out that we didn't have the removal of the paint included in the reserves. So that was a big expense that, you know, that somebody that came up with a reserve study back a few years before, didn't realize that that would be an expense. So, you know, over the years, like I said, we do have a reserve study, we're fully funded, but it's absolutely very common for board members to come up. And especially when they're small, you know, the bigger you get, you wanna just make sure that you have the experts, the engineers make those calls. Perfect. Thanks, Natalie. Um, so we kind of touched on this already a little bit. So this leads into this perfectly. Um, there are a couple different methods we can use for funding reserves. And we know there's the component or the straight line method or the pooled method. Um, Patricia, I know we kind of already touched on this, but kind of give me the, the um, difference between these two methods. Okay. Let me, let me break it up in um, um, method advantages, disadvantages, and first we're going to start with um, component or also called straight line. Um, that is the most conservative uh, funding method and uh, it is described in Florida Institutes. I like to describe it in a way that you need the time equivalency of every component in the bank. And as an example, let's say a normal sized AC unit um, with a 10 year life and a cost of $10,000 at the end of year five, you need $5,000 in the bank. At the end of year six, you need to have $6,000 in the bank. When you do that exercise with every single component and you add up all this, at the end of the given year, of the fiscal year, you have to have that amount in the bank to be considered 100% funded versus via the component straight line method. Normally, you are not allowed to cross utilize the funds which are set aside for, exam for example, for the roof, for painting, for resurfacing the pool, for paving new roads, unless the community, the association votes to cross utilize. And that has to be done in a certain way. So it's very cumbersome and um, also limits uh, board and management on, on uh, faster decisions. So the advantages are simply, are we, are we reserved great? Absolutely. Um, even component straight line tends to go into overfunding what you want to avoid. Again, here would the CPA come into play and explain why. Um, the disadvantages, again, are overfunding, um, not a lot of flexibility when you have not a, um, 
general vote and go ahead from your community to cross utilize. And, and then the accounting also becomes like um, quite difficult. So the other disadvantage is that the community members have to pay a rather high assessment fee. And um, you probably wouldn't even fund 100% because the amount, and I see it in my, in my examples, in my work files, high rises, if they would completely go with component funding, they would have to pay insane amounts of money. So usually they all are pooling. And pooling is, in my opinion, the best way to do uh, reserve funding. You have all uh, funds in, in one account. You do not need to go to the association, to the community to vote for cross-utilizing. The pooling is set up to be cross-utilized. So you take whatever money you need and um, the funding method will make sure that you will never drop below zero. Therefore, we also like to call it the threshold method. And here is the important point why we calculated for 30 years. The 30 years is what you see in front of the curtain. Behind the curtain, we are actually calculating another 20 years. And the reason for that is the negative break even point where the reserves in the pooling scenario would drop below zero, that negative break even point has to happen behind the curtain in between years 31 and 50. Therefore, it is so important to update the pooling uh, reserve account every year so we can push that negative break even point out behind the curtain behind year 31. There it can happen just on mathematical paper, so to speak. It will not happen in your 30-year scenario. So the advantages for pooling, less assessments quarterly or monthly, more liberty for management and board to operate. Um, the disadvantages, if you have a strong president who plays dictator and who has the rest of the board under his wing, so to speak, and you do not have checks and balances in place, <laughs> that person easily could go and uh, spend money because they say, oh, yeah, we have a million in reserve. We can do that uh, new pool or we can build that new clubhouse because it is the wish of the board or the, a, a strong president. So when I work with communities like this, unexperienced, going from component to pooling, I always advise them, talk to your CPA, talk to your attorney, and then maybe even get a checks and balances into place in form of a budget committee, reserve committee, and uh, they have to operate together with the board uh, to make things happen. And um, when you do this, I think pooling is one of the best uh, methods. And um, only the accountants, they are often um, grumbling because it's not easy to understand. You cannot do the calculation in an Excel spreadsheet or by hand component, you probably could, um, but pooling is a very complicated mathematical formula, which only can be done by a computer. So here you have my advantages and disadvantages. And if you have questions uh, about the two methods, please uh, put them in the chat or ask me later. Thanks Patricia for that answer. So the goal for all associations is to fully fund their uh, capital reserve contributions. And um, sometimes uh, not all associations do that. They partially fund and maybe in the early years that doesn't uh, bring up any issues, but over time that's gonna have a large impact on the association 
um, in the form of special assessments or, or otherwise. Um, Patricia, how can a condo association plan and fund for a reserve for reserve items, and what are the long term effects of underfunding reserves? Well, first of all, I would like to make one thing clear, which is often confusing for reserve study users. You often say, when I come into the boardroom and, and talk to managers and board members, they often tell me, we're funding 100%. And I say, okay, let me review your material. And they're not funding 100%. So you, you have to understand the difference between being 100% funded and funding your reserve requirements 100%. There is a big difference. And I explained in the component funding strategy where we speak about the time equivalency of every component and you add everything up. And when you have the time equivalency of every item in the bank by the end of the year, you are 100% funded. Let's say I'm calculating for you that you have to pay 250,000 into the reserve account in the upcoming fiscal year, and you are voting to reserve 250,000, then you are 100% funded and you are funding your reserve requirements 100%. Do you know how many associations do that? Zero. Uh, but they all say they are 100% funded. So that is just what I wanted to tell you to keep these two things apart from each other. And um, what are the long-term effects of underfunding reserves? Special assessments, um, obsolescence of the building, because you will push your replacements out and out and out. The quality of your building will suffer. Um, bank loans. Um, in our group here, we are dealing with, with high rises usually and, and more expensive property. But when we are going into property in the, in the low and medium income arena, um, also loans, um, FHA secured loans will not happen anymore when uh, a community is underfunded. And in the case of luxury or, or high quality um, properties, the buyers are very smart. They meanwhile not only want to see the condo declaration, they want to see the budget, not only for operating, but also for the reserves. And I have even heard uh, from real estate brokers cases where buyers requested the minutes of the board for the past year to read what is happening uh, behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. So um, you will lose your marketability, your place in the market. And um, that is one of the most important items mm -hmm. for our downtown uh, properties uh, to keep up with reserves so you don't, don't lose your competitive place in, in the market. Thanks, Patricia. Natalie, from your end, what, is, what are the recommendations with, um, with regards to ra raising association dues to maintain and to keep up with the reserves? Even keeping your fees the same, I don't think is a good idea. I think you always need to be going up at least with inflation, if not more, you know, uh, raising your fees is never a popular idea, but if you don't raise them, you can have a devastating impact on the long-term health of your association. You know, if you're delaying any replacement of your reserve components because you don't have adequate funds, those assets can begin to deteriorate. Uh, for example, you take a roof that's reached the end of its life expectancy, it needs to be replaced. 
or the wooden wooden siding on it needs to be replaced because it's rotting. If you push it past the useful life, it can lead into further damage. So now beneath the top structure of the roof, there's more damage that's happening. So now when you do do it eventually, it's going to cost you more to fix that. So over the time, those budget shortfalls can create deficits and, and then require loans or special assessments to cover those expenses because you will have to take care of it eventually. Um, so as you can see, not funding the proper amount, you know, can have very negative consequences. It's, it's just best to be realistic about the cost and put the actual cost that you get from that reserve study uh, for each individual reserve asset and set that money aside accordingly every year and put it into your budget. Yeah, thanks, Natalie. And you can see on the screen, um, Patricia and Natalie covered all four of these items. Negative inflation, partial reserve funding, special assessments, and deferred maintenance are just some of the uh, main items for underfunding the reserves. Um, so let's go here. Just a moment. So if you're not familiar with the process of a reserve study, you may have some preconceived ideas about them, especially when it comes to cost. And we, we talked briefly on this, Patricia, but some people say that reserve studies are too expensive. And what is the cost of conducting a reserve study? Well, it, it really depends on, um, on the type of association and type of building. Um, when we concentrate on uh, downtown property, of course, I'm thinking about high rises and no, a reserve study is not something you can shake out of your, of your arm like this. Um, it's a comprehensive um, building assessment uh, with inspection of, of the entire building from rooftop to, to ground floor and foundation, if necessary, um, all mechanical rooms, pumps, it's very, very, very comprehensive because we do not only um, concentrate on the building envelope, we go deep into the heart of the building. So the first reserve study, I'm not speaking about updates here, but usually a high rise study is between five and 5,000 and 7,500, depending on the size and complexity um, of the building. And um, updates, as I said in the beginning, uh, we do on an hourly basis because sometimes we are working with boards or managers, which are that quick, they have everything there. They sent me per email. We did this and this and this at this and this cost. Our new financials are attached. And it takes us maybe two or three hours to do an update. Mm -hmm. and, and currently we operate with a fee between $160 and $170 an hour, which is very reasonable. Um, when we have, when we are working with boards who want to have a certain process. And there are a lot of clients who have a budget meeting. So I come to the budget meeting. Then we do a first draft. Then we have another budget meeting and I do a second draft. Then we do uh, a board meeting and then um, the reserve study gets finalized and um, the board votes to approve it. And we do a final, um, form of the reserve study, which then can be published. If a board chooses to do that, by all means, we, we, we offer that as well. But usually it's a two to three hour process if a manager is knowledgeable and um, cooperative and forthcoming with all the information we need for an update. Thanks, Patricia. Natalie, people also <clears throat> say that whomever conducts the reserve study may find um, an additional way to make an association spend extra money or put, put extra items in the reserves uh, that they wouldn't necessarily have planned for. What's your response to that? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, you know, remember the reserve study analyst is not spending any money. They're just suggesting how you should spend it in an optimized way. Um, they look at every component and they tell you what they believe is best 
to do based on their expert opinions and the engineers that know those things. So the board can take that reserve study into consideration, but when it comes time to doing the budget, they don't have to completely copy it. And even as they work with the reserve analysts throughout the process, you can always reach out to them and say, hey, I think there's, you know, we're probably not gonna do as much paving you know, maybe we're going to get rid of those pavers or something like that. So it's not concrete. It can always be adjusted. Um, and the association is responsible how to spend those reserve funds. So it's absolutely not up to the reserve analyst. And just because, like I said, it's listed to be replaced in three years doesn't mean that it has to be replaced in three years. It's yours to take. And, and I very highly suggest that you do follow the reserve study. And if you find that something about it is not perfect, you get with you get with the expert and you make sure that it's the product that they find is best and so does the board of directors and the association. So, May I but, add something to that? Please. For example, a lot of my clients downtown, um, we always start at the very bottom. We try to get all into the reserve study we recognize as important for the building for the health of the building, for the longevity of the building. And windows is a good example. So first of all, we look into the declaration of condominium and, and if we can answer the question for ourselves, um, then we, okay, we can see association is responsible for windows. Happens from time to time, windows, sliders. So we include openings into the reserve study let's say the building is already 40 years old or 50 years old and we look 30 years into the future, of course, windows would be included. But then the board comes and says, we don't want that. Take it out. Um, we will make a decision to do a major facelift um, uh, 10, 15 years down the road and that will be a special assessment. So a good reserve analyst will raise red flags, point out every item, um, which has to be recognized, but then work with the board, hear their concerns and, and incorporate their changes and wishes into the reserve up to a certain point. When a board comes to me and wants me to take out roof or exterior paint and waterproofing, I am no game because these are essential um, structural items which are protecting the building envelope and they cannot be taken out. Just wanted to clear that up. Sure, thanks, Patricia. And I'll I'll definitely say from uh, the reserve studies that I've done, there there is always that shock factor when they first get it because there are items that boards don't think about. And uh, Patricia, whenever I've worked with you, that you know you've been very good about removing items that maybe are not those necessary ones. So, all right. So now once you've set aside your funds for reserve items and you're ready to move forward with the capital or restoration project, there are a few things to consider. Um, if your project involves a capital improvement change, you'll need a vote residents to approve the project. Um, Section 718.113, uh, Florida statute provides that 75% of the total voting interest of the association must approve the alterations or additions. George, are there cases that a vote is not required as we're asked all the time? <laughs> uh, well, it's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm gonna start by reading some of the language of the statute. It's 718.1132A. It says, except as otherwise provided in this section, there shall be no material alteration or substantial addition. So those are your key words, which all the case law turns on. Uh, and I'll get into that in, in a second. Um, so there should be no material alterations or substantial additions to the common elements of real property, which is association property, except in the manner provided in the declaration as originally recorded as amended. Um, now, if the declaration as originally recorded or amended does not specify the procedure for approving material alterations, the statute requires a 75% vote. But the way I read that section, if your governing documents allow you a lower threshold, then you can probably do the material alteration for a less than 75% vote, but that's okay. gotta be specifically in your governing documents. Um, there's a pretty wide body of law on material alteration out there. Um, I remember seeing a case a couple of years ago regarding um, a switch from like architectural tile to terracotta tile. 
Um, if you're changing like for like, or you know something's no longer to code, or that material is no longer available, then maybe you can get away with the um, with not getting the membership approval. Uh, the conservative advice is to get the membership approval um, if you're anywhere close to the line. I always struggle with advising clients because if you go to get the vote and then you're unable to get it, you're signaling to the membership and anybody that may want to challenge it that uh, this is a challengeable action, even if you arguably could get away with doing it without the vote. So, I mean, it's, it's a real dilemma there and in a lengthy discussion you should have a general counsel if um, anything steers anywhere close to being a material or being considered a material alteration. Sure. And would you say that most projects are capital re repair replacement versus uh, capital improvement? I think most clients try to categorize them as such regardless <laughs> of whether they are or not. Because uh, 75, uh, you, you, it's, it's hard to get 75% to vote to uh, lower assessments. It's just voter apathy. It's hard to get approval for anything. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're replacing like for like, you've got a great argument that's material alteration. In many of these cases, homeowners aren't going to challenge you if it doesn't make a huge increase in their assessments and if you're keeping the property nice. Um, you know, like I said, err on the side of getting the membership approval if it's close. I, I'm not going to name names, but I had an HOA that was required to get a vote and um, they replaced a clubhouse. And I would say it's about as substantial or material improvement as it could possibly be. Um, they left four beams from the original shell of the building and basically made a monstrosity three or four times the size of the original. Luckily for them, they were never challenged on it, but uh, I've definitely seen some folks stretch um, substantial improvement and uh, material alteration and what's a routine repair uh, quite a bit. Thanks, George. And one thing, especially for our portfolio managers, um, I think all of us have run into the changing of the paint color on the buildings and whether that is considered a material change or capital replacement. Um, is that something st strictly to the docs or would you say that there's a general answer for that? Well, I mean, any good general practitioner is not going to be able to give you an answer off the cuff unless they've researched that issue recently. But uh, th there's a, a big, big body of law on it. Um, and I would guess if they're saying changing from architectural tile to um, terracotta tile, that's probably a bigger change than a paint scheme. Um, changing from yellow to purple would be a much bigger change than changing from yellow to earth tone. So, um, you know, I don't know a perfect answer to that right now, but I'm going to stick with my basic advice. If, if you're in doubt, um, get the membership approval. And definitely before you, I mean, if you're going to spend $100,000 or whatever it costs to do a painting project, $10,000, $20,000, what's spending $500 on an opinion letter from council to see if you're doing it the right way? That way, if they tell you to do it, you've got somebody to blame if they gave you bad advice. Yeah. And um, I, I know from experience, changing a paint color on a building can be a huge huge uh, discussion. So with that said, Jimmy, um, talking about changing the color in a building, how can an association optimize the results in um, an exterior painting project? Walk us through that. Well, uh, before I, I walk you through that, I want to say I get asked a lot, say, hey, if we just change two shades darker, two shades <laughs> higher, two shades to the left, the right, can we get away with it? Yeah. You need to uh, consult your legal counsel. <laughs> I, I can't get into that. Um, but uh, first and foremost, uh, you, you need to get the, the proper expert to write a specification. Um, the spec is going to have detailed product information, application information. It's going to have a scope of work to what's covered uh, when, when you get the bid uh, for the project, um, especially on difficult areas or maybe like your, your, your glass to metal, your metal to stucco, things like that, where, where waterproofing and sealants are required. Um, as a paint supplier, we can write a basic paint spec if that's all you need. Um, that, that's going to cover just, you know, your, your, your paint to paint, paint to sealer, things like that. Um, if we find any uh, detailed problem areas, uh, we'll probably refer you to an engineer 
to, to write a specification. Um, that happens. That happens a lot. Uh, but the specs will also contain uh, the most important part will contain the warranty information and the the paint or coating manufacturer is the one who needs to write that warranty. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, we have a quick question that we, that's from um, Ty Wilson. If owners approve the reserve study, can that be the 75% approval when the project comes ready to do? A question for me or? I'm gonna guess you, George. Okay. Um, my conservative answer is, is gonna be um, them approving the funding levels of a reserve account doesn't necessarily mean that they're approving the specific material alteration. Now, if the proxy that they voted uh, very specifically had different paragraphs and indicators showing that they're voting for those two different things, then yes, it would probably work. But a blanket approval to lower or raise reserve funding, is it gonna authorize them changing architectural shingles to terracotta shingles? Thanks, all right, Patricia, when is it necessary to select an engineer to draw up the plan specifications and to oversee the bidding process for the contractors and contractor selection? Well, now that we added on engineering services, my answer should be <laughs> my answer should be any time. I figured time. as much. <laughs> but my answer is not going in that direction. I always say, please use common sense. I so often um, work with um, associations which do not even move a finger without hiring an engineer. It's ridiculous. Don't waste your money. Um, use common sense. If you are a three-story building and you are putting paint on that building every eight years, you don't need an engineer to oversee that work. You have your insurance package in place with liability, workers' comp, etc. And you will call Sherwin Williams to get your paint specs. And then you get your three bids and there you go. But as soon as you are tapping into building envelope, structural, changes to the roof, stucco problems, as uh, Jimmy mentioned, when the, when the spec, when your paint specialist comes out and discovers uh, stucco problems or even rebar, problems you know the, um, especially on the islands we see that happen very often of course you need to hire an engineer right away for larger projects uh pain projects on high rises where you're dealing with so many more uh quirks um should you hire an engineer yes because you are not spending twenty five thousand for a building you are spending three hundred thousand three hundred fifty thousand to paint your building and more. And do you want to really be able to compare properly? And then it really pays to hire an engineer who is based on the specs provided by the paint company, who is writing exactly the scope of work. And the bidders have to fill out the scope of work. And then you can, com can compare apples to apples and have a, a better decision-making process. So I would really say use, use common sense. Uh, the bigger the project, the more you want to take an engineer. And as soon as you are ta uh, talking about building envelope, uh, structural, you also want to work with an engineer. And of course, everything what is mechanical, if there is um, big issues. And you know, if you're exchanging a domestic pump, you don't need to hire an engineer. But if you're redesigning your, your electrical vault or your mechanical vault where, where you're holding your fire pumps and your domestic pumps and everything, you need an engineer. Yeah, thanks, Patricia. And just one quick statement on that. Uh, while your association manager, your CAM, your Natalie is incredible in everything they do, they are not able to be a project manager for these large scope projects. So how many times that I've been expected to go out and know if the right nails were used at the right angle? Listen. 
I don't know. But I, we do have a question from Irv. Can a condo board unilaterally, unilaterally decide to add components to its reserve schedule or does it need to be owner approved? We'll start, uh, George, with that, you. Um, I, I believe it needs to be membership approved. If it's, uh, I know the HOA statute a little bit better in the HOA world, um, re reserve components are either added by the developer originally or membership vote. Uh, Patricia may be able to back me up, but I'm pretty sure that should be a membership vote, not a board vote to establish new reserve categories or components. Now the statute mandates certain ones. If something started out as a $5,000 repair work and it, it inches towards, it gets over 10 K, then it's mandatory that you create that reserve component in condo world. Um, but there's, you know, aside from the 10 K threshold, there's the, the roof, the painting and, and the uh, paving parking lot categories that are mandatory by the statute. Your governing documents may also require certain reserve components. Right. Patricia may be able to shed some more light on this as well. Thanks, George. Well, I would say um, we often have the case that we discover that major items have never been in the reserves because they were simply forgotten. One of the best examples are the railings. Um, you know, you can fight about windows and, 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 and sliders, uh, doors, openings in general. Will they be a facelift? Will they be um, owner responsibility or association responsibility? But railings are um, safety and part of the structural. Um, and a lot of associations don't reserve for railings. So when the reserve analysts recognizes that lack um, and includes the railings in the reserves. I mean, that is back to you, George. The question is that really required that the, as the community needs to vote to put the railings into the reserves when it is a requirement because it's over 10,000, it should be in there. Well, if it's over 10,000, it, it's it, the way I read the statute, you, you, you have carte blanche to go ahead and make it a dedicated right. component. Um, it's, it, I would have, you know, if, if it's a component that's less than 10K and you don't have a membership vote, that's where you probably want to get an opinion letter from general counsel yeah. um, to make sure that that's something. And you could probably be creative with how you do this. I mean, you could lump railing if it's not quite 10k with something closely related to it and if those items 10k then maybe you could arguably get away with it without a membership vote um oh, the railings i'm talking about are like three three hundred fifty thousand. oh I'm then it's automatically right it's automatically a reserve account <laughs> anything that's over 10k you're required to have as a reserve component yeah and, um if you haven't been reserving for it then you're, you're going to be in a bind to hurry up and jump those uh reserve yeah. amounts up Okay, great, thanks. Great question, appreciate that. All right, so now we've identified the project, we've gotten the vote of the membership, and now we wanna talk about creating a financial plan. Um, and so we finalize, like we said, we finalized the specifications. How are we gonna pay for this project? Um, on the screen, you're looking at some questions a bank might ask about your reconstruction project. Should you need a loan to complete the work? Um, so what components in the study are included in the plan project? Will there be any other components to be worked on during the life of the loan? Should they be bundled with the current project? What other expenses will there be during the life of the loan? And will work on other components need to be delayed during the life of the loan? Patricia, is a reserve study required in order to secure a loan? Yes, I've um, worked with a lot of um, associations uh, to secure um, loans through providing proper reserve studies for them and often got questions from the bank or feedback from the bank. So yeah, if um, an association needs to um, get a loan, and this is nothing bad. I mean, a lot of high-rise um, facade uh, facelift projects are being financed. Um, why not? Money is cheap right now. So there's nothing bad about, about it. But you want to have an updated reserve study 
um, to present to the bank, that will always be a, an advantage for you. And um, also for your um, insurance, it is um, a good idea to have a reserve study because a lot of insurance agents are actually looking at um, the reserves, how uh, financially responsible is the association? Is the association a high risk or a lower risk? The better your reserves are, the lower you are, your risk um, assessment is. And um, the agents can try to play that with the carrier and say, look, this is a class A uh, client with excellent reserves in place. They are responsible, they are fiscally responsible. So from an insurance and bank standpoint, it's very important. Natalie, from a manager standpoint, what other um, items should board members be cognizant of when they're starting a long-term project like, th like this? Document everything. Make a plan and put it in writing because we know that projects can sometimes take months or years to complete. The board is probably going to change over the course. Maybe not. Maybe one person. Uh, maybe less people get involved, more people get involved. You have to make sure it's in writing. It's important to put it in the minutes because sometimes if you just put it in a manager's report, it might get lost over the years and, and not be found. Where in, in the minutes, it's actually concrete. Um, and then we'll ensure less complications later for you. Awesome. And George, um, what if over the estimated, um, what if you overestimate the cost of the project never happens? Can you use the funds allocated in that project for other projects that may come up? Are you talking about surplus loan proceeds that you haven't expended because you took out a greater loan than what was necessary? That, or maybe you special assessed for thinking it was going to be more and you have extra money left over from that? No, that's a good question. I apologize. I don't have a perfect answer there. With regard to um, loan proceeds, your loan documents and agreement with the bank may dictate what you have to do with any surplus funds, and you're probably drawing down on the loan as you complete the project. Uh, with regard to the serve, reserve funding, uh, this may be a Patricia question, and it, and it may depend upon whether you've got the pooling or component method of accounting in the reserves. Um, Obviously, um, if, if, you, if it is a refund, then it would go back to unit owners in a proportionate share that they pay assessments and, and that kind of thing. Thanks, George. Uh, Natalie, you have anything to add on that? Good to just allocate it to something that it's for. So if you did a plumbing project and you have $8,000 left in that surplus, use it for plumbing. This is As such a great question. General counsel is okay with that, you know? Okay, very good. All right. So now we have the reserve study, we have the specs, we have our findings, and we have our funding. So uh, you're out looking for a general contractor to oversee your project. And pursuant to provisions of Chapter 489, your contractor may work with a licensed architect thereby complying with Florida Statute 718.3026, saying that contractors with uh, the, excuse me, that contracts with an association's attorney, accountant, architect, community association manager, engineering, and landscape architect services are exempt from competitive bidding requirements. Woo. There is a similar requirement for homeowners associations contained in 720.3055. George, what do the statutes say about using this method, i.e. loophole? <laughs> well, uh, 718 also has a provision that says any contracts in excess of 5% um, require the competitive bidding. It doesn't necessarily say how many you have to get. Um, I always encourage my clients to try to get as, you know, several bids, uh, maybe three is a good rule of thumb. Um, there'll be certain areas where you just don't have enough competitors in a particular market to get three competitive bids. Um, but I, I think it's always a good idea to get as many you know, bids as possible to show you've done your due diligence. You don't necessarily have to take the lowest bid, um, and, and nor should you a lot of times. Um, 
you're going to want to do a little bit of background work on the companies. And you, we mentioned that word fiduciary duty earlier. Um, so the part of that fiduciary duty and the business judgment rule is to do some due diligence. And the more competitive bids you get, um, the, the, you protect yourself from liability there. It's a risk management function as well as a statutory requirement. Yeah, thanks, George. And uh, Patricia, one of the questions we had to this section was about what are the pros and cons about using an engineer? And you uh, you actually covered that for us uh, prior to talking about using common sense. Is there anything else you'd like to expand on um, using an engineer, the pros and cons of that? Well, um, I want to loop into what, what George said. The lowest bidder is, is not necessarily the best. And um, from my experience in construction, and I did actually project, project site supervision, um, we built large hospital campuses. And uh, I always saw that the subtrades using the lower bids, they always came in with the highest change orders. Yep. So that is a very important aspect when you hire an engineer, the engineers can oversee um, the change orders if they are really necessary, if the change orders comply with the topic of, of, of the project, with the overall theme of the project, uh, the engineers also can oversee that the materials you are actually paying for are brought to the site. Let's say you, you order Kohler um, fixtures and uh, then get American Standard, just as an example. So that is another thing the engineer can do. Quality assurance, um, also looking at labor. Um, are the companies complying with OSHA for your own sake? That is an important factor the engineers should oversee. So change orders, correct material, correct application of labor, uh, following all uh, labor laws and OSHA safety laws. Thanks, Patricia. Um, so Jimmy, you're out at a property, you've made all the specs up for a, a big painting job. How are you deciding uh, what painting contractors to bring into the mix, whether that's you or Sherwin-Williams? What are you basing that on? This is a, a question I, I get asked all the time, almost every project I, I deal with. Um, uh, the board will or the manager will say, hey, can you give me some bidders for this project? The very first thing I do is, is turn it back around and ask them, um, are there any painting companies that you've worked with in the past uh, that you want to work with again or don't want to work with again? <laughs> you know, yeah. there, there's some, some on both ways. Um, also ask them if there's any, you know, re requirements that, that they want specifically. Like I've had one board say, you know what, we're in Bradenton. We want a Bradenton contractor. We don't want someone from Tampa. We don't want someone from Fort Myers. We want someone right here. Which, you know, understandable, it's their right. Um, so taking all that information, um, I use our knowledge and history of, of our, our, of course, licensed and insured contractors who can do these jobs. Uh, the ones who's done similar projects, uh, who does good work, um, has a good reputation in the industry and will provide three to four bidders. Now, I've been on some pre-bids where there are eight or nine painting contractors show up. That's just, that's nuts. You're, you're, you're never going to find a shortage of painters in, the, in this market. So if you get three to five bidders, you're, 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 doing, you're, you're doing good. Thanks, Jimmy. <clears throat> All right. Did I go backwards here? Okay, so when you choose to hire a consultant or a representative project manager or ask the engineer to manage the project, you will need someone to oversee, coordinate, and perform the services necessary for a successful project. Um, like you see on the screen, these are some items that uh, you need to be thinking about during your project. Um, so, and Jimmy, we kind of touched on this earlier, but um, kind of what we have on screen here and what you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, what are, the, what are the things that we need to be thinking about, let's say in the instance of a successful painting project? Sure, uh, just 
just very, very basic steps. Um, uh, do an evaluation. Uh, does it does it need a, a, a Sherwin specification or does it need an engineer specification? Um, or, you know, if, if you need an engineer, uh, do you want to get an architect involved if you're making really drastic changes? Um, we create the specification. Um, we can also create imaging work for the, for the, uh, for the property uh, that involves, you know, if there's a color change, we can take a picture, give them some options and all that's a, a free service from the suppliers. Um, and then um, recommend the contractor or recommend the painters to, to do the pre-bids or, or to do the bids. Um, during the project, we'll do uh, the supplier will do site visits to make sure, you know, things are being applied properly. Uh, the, the right materials are being purchased. And then at the end of the job, we'll extend a warranty. So it all sounds simple, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks. I think the warranty is the most important part about that. Um, Patricia, what basic steps would you recommend in addition to the list that we provided here? Um, well, so because of the nature of DSCA, I'm always thinking high rise. I always have high rise in my mind. So um, I would like to add um, to this list a, a timeline, a schedule. Um, the contractor has to reach certain accomplishments by the end of week one or by the end of month one, depending on the size of the project. Um, I would recommend that um, the management does a daily inspect after um, the construction day is finished and make sure that there is a daily cleanup and a sweep. When you're working with steel, nails, um, have projects which involve metal, nails, etc., you want to have a metal, a magnetic sweep at the end of the day. So you make sure there is nothing on the walkways in the driveways which could pierce uh, your tires or injure people walking through that areas. Um, you also want to make sure that um, you have the correct walkthroughs with your engineer to make sure that the draws the subcontractors and contractors are requesting are on time and justified because mm -hmm. they want to have financial draws of course. Um, then um, we already touched here in the list on insurance. After everything is done, you want to in, in have your insurance appraisal updated and submit it to your uh, insurance agent. And at, when the next reserve study is due, your reserve uh, analyst should be involved and, and should know what has happened to the building. So when you do, when you work with a reserve analyst on an annual basis, the analyst will be included. I'm often invited to uh, construction sites to observe what is happening to clients' buildings of mine. So, and then finally, in the end, uh, for big projects, you want to have a spec book where every specification of every trade is included. And you also want to have the final as-built plans because when you do a bigger uh, construction project, um, you will have uh, preliminary plans, then you will have plans which go to the um, building department and get stamped and approved, that's a permit set. But during the construction, the super might have changes or there are changes necessary to work around a certain area and they will be included in the uh, final as-built plans. So you always should have a final set of as-built plans and um, keep them safe in um, your computer files. If you get them in paper form, get them to a, uh, a printing uh, company or a scanning company like Staples Desert or Jeffco. There are several out there and have them scanned and digitized. Um, they should always be contained in the association files. They are very important to keep. Yeah, I think that's all I have on my list. Thank you, Patricia. Those are great, great uh, suggestions, especially for anyone who's had a nail on their tire. I appreciate that. Uh, George, outside of number five, which of course is the most important, what are, what are you feeling like? Anything to add to this list? Well, uh, unfortunately, most of the time, 
clients come to us to look at contracts and loan documents after there's a dispute. Not often enough do they run them past us at the beginning of a project. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of different things to look at, whether it's a subrogation uh, clause or choice of forum or all kinds of things to think about and look at. And we'll usually do an opinion letter and go line by line, contract, make suggestions. And uh, you do have some bargaining power at that point. Another thing, if you're getting a loan for a project, you're going to want your attorney to take a look at the loan documents as well. Uh, typically in condos and HOAs, you're not able to uh, pledge collateral for your loans. You're basically pledging the right to receive your assessments as collateral. And I've seen some banks, I won't mention names, that use a boilerplate template for their loans that just don't meet the requirements of the statute uh, for either condos or HOAs. Thanks, George. Natalie, what do you have to say from the office of the manager about this? As far as the contracts go, absolutely, the attorney should do the legal review. I also think it's important to let the contract be reviewed by the insurance agent and the engineer, of course. I know the engineer has his own contract, but any subcontract, anything else, they should all take a look at it. Um, and then, of course, like I keep saying, document everything, you know, make your plan and make your own documentation, have inspections before and after, take your own pictures, in addition to what the contractors are doing, keep your own records. Um, and then communicating is so important, you know, not only the communication between the engineer and the vendors and the board members, but the owners, the owners are going to be dealing with that day to day. Uh, whether it's a hassle, maybe it's not a hassle, but still, if there's something going on in the community, it's a project, whether it's a month long, a week long, or a year, you know, you want to communicate to them, let them know what's going on, keep them posted, you don't have to go too much into detail, but just let them know that you're, you're keeping them posted. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Natalie. Great advice on that. All right, um, so we are at the end of our program. I don't see any questions in the chat. At this time, I'd like to open it up to any questions and you're welcome to take yourself off mute and ask them, or you can still put them in the chat and we'll field them there. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, if, if I may, and uh, I don't know how to use this chat room thing and all that stuff, so sorry, you'll have to hear my voice. Uh, uh, I'm Doug Owen, and I'm curious, how do you calculate uh, a fully funded reserves under the pooled method? Oh, Lord, Patricia. <laughs> you and Doug might have to go have a drink and figure that one out. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the question for me. And um, as I explained, um, the component straight line can be a good Excel user will be able to create um, a, a, a spreadsheet to do the component funding in Excel, but the pooling method cannot be calculated in Excel, not by hand. It's a very complicated formula, um, which only can be done by a computer system, um, you cannot recreate it. I, I had this question a lot of times and I had desperate people sitting there trying to recreate it and never came up with it and said, it's just simply not possible. It's proprietary um, software from um, uh, software engineers. The, you have a couple of different providers out there who are offering pooling methodology, but it is, um, the secret of the computer. <laughs> okay, so Patricia, is this a software that you're saying that only um, like a, a company like yourself has? Is this something they can go to Staples and buy? No, um, I, for example, I use Reserve Analyst. Uh, it's um, two engineers out of California and they provide that uh, software for like two decades. Um, there are other companies out there um, but they don't offer really good services. So a reserve analyst is um, one of the widest recognized uh, reserve um, software programs out there. They're also a member of uh, CAI and um, they meet all national and international standards for reserve study analysis. 
Thank you. Thank and you. Thanks, thanks, Doug, for that great question. Any other questions? We did have a request for the PowerPoint to be emailed, emailed out to the participants. So we, I'm certain we can do that. Um, any other questions before we flip this over to Kristen? Yeah, I have a question. Hi, everybody. Uh, we talk, you talked a lot and, and uh, very well explained a lot of the procedures you go through, but you know, accumulating the, the money to pay for these future projects is of equal importance. And so are there any statutes that tell, uh, uh, that tell condominiums what they're allowed to invest this money in to get the maximum return? That's, that's a big factor in how much you have to pay every year. I think that's a George question. I was gonna say, George. Uh, I'd, 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 the, the statute designates how to save for reserves and how to waive reserves and what you need to put in your financial reports. It doesn't get into great detail about investment vehicles. So your best bet there is to go to your banker. Certain banks have better condo HOA products than, than others. Um, Natalie may know a little bit more about this, but the statute generally 718, um, generally tells you, you know, what you have to reserve for, how to go about changing fully funding or, or, or waiving those reserves, what kind of notices you need to put in your financial report and that kind of thing. It doesn't get as specific as saying you have to invest in these type of bonds or this type of money market account. But, um, you know, I think your banker, you know, if it has a condo HOA product, will be able to help you out in that regard. Okay, yeah, and I would think that, uh, you know, you want to keep risk as low as possible. It's really, this is not so much about getting a great return. Keep the risk low, and then you're sure that the money's there anyway. Agreed. Okay, thank you. I, I have a question. Um, Here. Many downtown condominiums are probably similar to ours in that they're 30 plus years old. And when ours was established, the developer never included in the reserve a component for window replacement. And we're considering replacing our windows and it's either gonna, well, it most likely is gonna end up through a special assessment. But my question is, should we decide to fund, try and fund it through our reserve? Uh, would you say we could include in the estimated replacement cost, uh, not only the hardware or the cost of in this example, the windows, but also the professional fees that would be associated with this large project. Yes, I would, I would highly recommend to, to look at the project as a whole and not only uh, include the material you cannot get the windows in without the proper labor. And then there's also the question when your high rise is uh, located in a flood zone and it is not properly elevated up to base flood elevation, you might have to abide by the 50% FEMA rule. So that is another um, item to consider, which you might want to look into when it comes to that point. In terms of including it in the reserves or do a special assessment, I also would recommend here that you always work with a reserve specialist first in including it. Include it first and see where your pooling and component straight line methodologies get you. And, and see how is it affecting the reserves. And then you can, you can plan it out. You can say, okay, maybe let's do it in stages. Let's do the sliders first and then the windows, or um, let's do one portion or do it floor by floor. And there are possibilities to run different financial scenarios to see what the impact of the windows will be in your reserves. And then you have a better education and can come to a better conclusion and say, Nah, it's, it's better to do it in a special assessment or take out a loan. 
Thanks, Thank Patricia. You. Thanks, Herb, for the question. I'm going to ask if there's any future questions that you please email our panelists, and we'll be glad to get that information out to you. Um, we're, we're getting close to the time, so I'm going to go ahead and just Thank you again to the DSCA for supporting this event, um, and especially for all the hard work put in. I think Eileen really touched on this already, Jamie and Kristen, and, um, and for our associate members and events for giving us the uh, platform to discuss important matters like this for our industry. And now I want to flip it over to Kristen Forey, who's going to... Um, she is our associate member liaison and introduce the Platinum Sponsors. Kristen? Thank you, Alex, and great job leading our discussion today. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, and uh, many thanks to our speakers as well. Thank you for your time and information. Um, as we know, events like this would not be possible without our Platinum Associate members. So I hope everyone will stick around to hear about their services. Um, each sponsor will present a gift card to winners. So. Um, go ahead, uh, Platinum members, and get your numbers ready between 2 and 16. So when I, call, um, when I call your name, you can announce your number, and I'll let you know who your winner is. Um, now, I am the um, liaison to the associate members. I'm also a Platinum member. Uh, again, my name is Kristen Forey, and I represent Core Marketing Solutions. I have a portfolio of clients, professional plumbing. Uh, for plumbing and pipelining, Rufuside West for roof maintenance, and two of my clients are also Platinum members, CBiz Association Insurance, who takes care of your associate, association insurance. And as you all know, rates are going up drastically next year, really drastically for some of you. So um, make sure uh, one of the comments that uh, my representative, Matthew Mercier, has um, suggested is that you contact your district representative about the rate hikes. Um, maybe there's something we can all do about that. Um, so, and if you have any questions about your insurance, let me know. I can get that to him. Uh, I also represent Rightway Emergency Services. They handle all of your emergencies, such as fire, water, mold, and disaster planning. And they are also a platinum member. Um, so if you need an additional information about that, um, emergency services, which you might need after this big storm, <laughs> let me know. I'll get that information to you as well. Uh, the numbers that I uh, picked today is, uh, first one is four, and that would be from myself. And I've got to look at the list. Four is going to be uh, Jerome and Catherine Chesley from Le Chateau. Congratulations, I'll be sending you a $25 gift card. Um, the next one from CBiz Association Insurance, we'll be sending Michael Fitzpatrick from the Mark Sarasota. And um, Matthew will be sending you a gift card, Michael. And last but not least, um, number 14, is Anthony Joseph uh, from Bay Plaza uh, Rightway Emergency Services. We'll be sending you a $25 gift card as well. And continuing on in our list, um, Alex Turner from Associate Gulf Coast is one of our Platinum Associate members. So Alex, go ahead and tell us about Thanks. your company and pick your number. Sure, um, start with my number, it's lucky number five. And uh, Kristen, thank Matt for his hour by hour update email <laughs> that I got on where the storm was all day today. I knew where the storm was all day. So thanks, Matt, for that. Um, so I am Alex Turner with Associate Gulf Coast Management. And uh, we do mid-rise, high-rise condo HOA. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about your association or if you just need a vendor referral or education. Um, also big on board member education. So I'd love to help you out. Uh, feel free to give me a shout whenever. And who's my winner, Kristen? Your winner, number five, is Ron Connors at 1350 Maine. All right, Ron Connors. Woohoo. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Alex. And thanks again uh, for leading us in our discussion today. Um, next, we have Dee Smith with Nature Zone. Dee. Hello. Um, I'm Dee with Nature Zone. I think that Patrick still has me blocked out. I guess um. <laughs> I'm blocked anyway, out too, I think. I'm your local hard killer. Um, 
been killing it. I probably y'all are lucky you don't see me right now because I've been rained on three times today. It's been a horrible day. I think I was the last person over the Skyway before they shut it down again. And I'm going to tell you right now, nothing like white knuckling over the Skyway when you have broken knuckles and a broken hand. Oh. Um, but it's okay. Um, there she is. Life is good. Um, we're out there. We're still working. And I'm sure after this here little storm, we're going to have a lot of bugs bugging us. Um, just want to thank y'all all for being part, you know, letting us be part of y'all's group downtown because we are all a team together and we all work together. And one thing that really matters a lot is um, the camaraderie that we all have. You know, and, and a lot of people don't see this. And whenever we do events like this with Patricia and Jimmy and and and, and Natalie and everybody and, and Alex, you know, all talking about and getting together and talking about the, the situations that we need to be facing and looking at downtown. Sarasota's not getting smaller, people. It's people to grow. And when it does, we all need to have these these people and these specialists that can can guide us in the right directions. Uh, and that, um, my lucky number is always 13. And so what have I got, Kristen? Number 13 is Kathy Jones. All right, Mama Kathy. I'll see her soon. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, Dee. Okay, let me see who we have next here is, I believe is Patricia Stabler, one of our panelists today with Stabler Appraisals. Hello again. I talked so much today. I don't think I have to add a whole lot. You all know me. You know what I do. You know that what I want to add is I love what I do. I don't go to work a single day in my life because I'm just having fun every single day. And I want to thank all my clients for making my life fun. That's all I want to say. My lucky number is seven. Is it still available? Number seven? I pick, I pick seven, so you'll have to pick another one. Nine. Nine. Nine is Charlie Nagelschmidt. Nagelschmidt. Um, and so that is your winner. I'll send you the information, Patricia. So congratulations, Charlie. And I, I believe, do we still have Jim Toll with Tannenbaum Scrow? on board yes can hi you hear Jen. Me? hi yeah. so first of all my lucky number is eight okay i'll let you announce the the winner at the end but i just okay. want to build on what george said during the program which was you know many times these contracts on these major projects they're initiated by either the engineer or the architect they tend to be form contracts some of the engineering firms have their own sort of specialized contracts but um, you know, we at, at Tannenbaum, Scro, Lamol, and Kleinberg, we feel like we're uniquely qualified to review and analyze and suggest changes to these contracts because we deal with the dispute resolution on the back end when projects go wrong, and um, and so that's one of the services that we provide. So thank you everyone for uh, joining us on this uh, Veterans Day. Who's who's my winner? Thank you, Jim. We have Anthony Joseph is your winner. All right. Congratulations, Anthony. All right, everyone. Thank you so much um, for tuning in. And DSCA, thank you so much for giving us a platform. And again, thank you to uh, Alex and our panelists. Great presentation today. Happy Veterans Day. I guess that's it. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.